moisture flow through the envelope. This is our third part. If you remember way back at the early slides, we talked about three parts. We talked about the air flow, we talked about the heat flow, and now we're gonna talk about the moisture flow. Mm -hmm. And this is our last section. And so we have four moisture transport methods, and we do it with the other two all the time with a couple of new things. We have bulk water. And what we mean by bulk water, it's our rain, snow, groundwater. <clears throat> We have to have a source, we have to have a hole in the envelope, and we have to have a driving force, which can either be gravity or air pressure. So if we have rain coming down on a roof, we'll have gravity as our force, you know, mm -hmm. that's bringing the water down our mm -hmm. building. And as it runs down the side of the building, if we have negative pressures inside the building, then we have a driving force air moving in that'll pull the moisture in. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So if the building's negative, we can actually draw moisture in. And so air pressures can move moisture in and out. Or we have wind, if we have a lot of wind. So with the south, Louisiana, Texas, mm -hmm. um, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, all along there, they are to have this driving rain and with the wind, it will actually be pushing water through their walls. And so that is bulk water. That's, mm -hmm. that's not just a little bit of moist air or anything. That's bulk water. We have a lot of water. And we can drive that in through our buildings. But we can build our buildings correctly to stop that moisture getting in there. Right. And the building science that we've been talking about for the last several hours is we want to keep the water out of those areas that's going to cause damage. Then the next one's capillary action or wicking. And we know if we have a paper towel and we hold it upright and we have a little puddle on the table and we set it down in the water, it's going to crawl up, and yeah. wick up the paper towel. Well, water will wick up in concrete because concrete's porous and it will wick up in wood. So if you have wood in contact with wet concrete, moisture will literally wick up inside the wood. And then we have an issue with the water the mold and the mildew and the degradation of the, the wood itself because mm. it's wet all the time. So capillary action will be one of them. Air transported moisture or that moisture that's within air that is moving in and out. We talked about the air flow through the envelope. And as soon as it strikes a cold or cool surface and we hit dew point, we have condensation. Now why did we not have so much in past days because they leak so much that they dried pretty well. Mm -hmm. You know, there was so much leakage through the walls that they dried pretty well. As we tighten up and build a tighter wall and we insulate it better, we don't dry as well. So we gotta make sure that we keep the water out of there. And then vapor diffusion is the last one and that is moisture that is literally within the air. You know, when you take a shower or whatever we have, you know, it's moist in the air. Mm -hmm. And that moisture in the air, that will also pass through building materials or into building materials and be absorbed into the building materials. So um, all four of those methods can move water into our structure. Now I just threw in a slide because building sciences has told us how to do this now because we've learned from mistakes. And this is just, AMSCO has a direction on how they want to see their windows flash so their windows don't leak. And there's a science to it. We don't need to go through the whole thing, but basically real quick, it, it will tell you if you read the written instructions on how they want the air barrier wrapped around, and then they want ceiling flashings down on the bottom, put the window in, then you do the sides, then you do the top, and then you bring the air barrier over the top. And what they're doing here is they're providing a seal, but they're also providing that if the water gets through, by the time you've completed the window, any water that gets in here will run down, run down, and just run out of the bottom of the wall because of the way they layered this layer first, then this one goes over the top. Mm -hmm. If they turned them around, it would come down, and then it would go inside the paper so we have we have great instructions on how to do them if we just do it right so the effects of moisture on occupants um, what does it do to the occupants 
and it's the same um, that we, we saw in the others. It's health and safety and mold and bacterial growth, al allergic reactions and asthma, sick building syndromes. And six, you know, there's been some products used in building construction, formaldehydes and glues and mm -hmm. stuff like that. They don't do it much now. Uh, in fact, what well, was it, three or four years ago, one of the wood floor manufacturers, distributors here in town had brought in a bunch of um, pre-finished wood floor from China and it was found that it had too much formaldehyde in it and they had, to, they had to tear a bunch out and they had to, you know, it, it really cost them a lot of business. Oh, I'm sure. And I mean, and some of those, some of those chemicals and stuff and finishes um, can cause some serious, serious health issues. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we need to do is be aware of that and you know the moisture and the contaminants and all three of these, the air flow, the heat flow, and the moisture flow all tie together to, um, to create a bad situation or a good situation if we do it right. Um, and then of course we have the comfort issues, high humidity's not comfortable, your perspiration doesn't evaporate, and if it's too dry, then we, we have you know some static shock and stuff like that. But high humidity is the big ones we're concerned about. Here's an outside wall that's been stripped. It had, um, I'm guessing it had a stucco product on it, but I'm not positive. Maybe it was a stone product. And water and, got in from behind. And water got in behind it because yeah. they hadn't applied their weather barrier correctly. Okay. And so water got in behind it and created a mold problem yeah. <laughs> it looks like. and that's that, that was a pretty expensive repair yeah you i know? bet that all had to be ripped out or yeah i'm sure all this had to come off you know that's that's a that's a really pricey repair and then you have to redo whatever surface you know whether it's a stucco or a siding or, mm. or whatever material um so it pays yeah. to do it right. It pays <laughs> to do it right. And this is the source of a bunch of litigation. I mean, it really is. Um, here's a picture. This is an interesting picture I got from um, Building America. They, they're one of the groups that work with Department of Energy. And moisture effects on durability. So we know that moisture is going to degrade the building as it obviously is done here. Mm -hmm. And you first look at this picture. And my first thought is, it's leaking. There's something leaking, but the insulation up top doesn't look like it's saturated. It doesn't. And then you look a little closer, and, I, uh, and I'm cheating because I, I know what they said with the picture. <laughs> but what's this right here? It's the pipe, is it a pipe? Well, that's a pipe, but what's behind it? Why is it white? It's because it's frozen, oh. it's frost. Okay. Which leads me to make the assumption, and this is what they said, is it's condensation. Oh, that wall is wow. so cold that it's con you know, we have a high moisture load in uh -huh. this in this basement, obviously, because that's a lot of moisture condensing on those walls. It's so cold that it's condensing, but the surface is also cold enough that in this one corner it's actually freezing that condensate. And so that's not a weather barrier leak. This is a condensation issue. Okay. Now imagine if this wall was framed and this was all buried behind the wall, what would you have? We'd have a bunch of moisture behind it in the dark, which encourages mold mm. growth. And so we'd have a big issue. Um, not as hard on the concrete as it's going to be on this framing. But you know that framing over there and whatever's on the other side of it is going to be, you know, that's an outside wall because there's a hose bib going outside. Um, so yeah, that's that's a big durability thing. Uh, we talked previously in the 70s when we messed up and uh, required all those vapor barriers. We talked a little bit about how OSB delaminates when it gets wet. Um, and I mentioned this just briefly, but probably ought to make another note on it. The, the building code, not the energy code, um, has actually addressed where we have those roof systems and moisture comes up just by heat rising. 
on the on the other side of that roof deck, the uh, code has now addressed it. And in certain climate zones, starting with our climate zone, you have to use a spray foam or an insulation on top of the roof deck. Otherwise, you are going to have a durability issue with your roof, and you're going to be out there walking on the roof, and it's going to be soft and spongy, so the roof's going to have to come off, and the sheathing has to be replaced, and it gets really expensive. But then you got to solve the problem. Why is it doing it? Mm -hmm. And it's because we have just fiberglass insulation in the wrong spot. Mold, again, is an issue, and with lots of moisture, it encourages insect infestations. We don't have a lot of termite issues here, but they do in the south because termites like moist areas. And moisture is, without question, the single greatest cause of construction defect litigation going on right now. <clears throat> and uh, I think we've already answered your question that you had had on this one earlier. Is is this is not a water leak, this is condensation. I do want to know how you feel about the batting <laughs> insulation. About the what? The, the insulation. <laughs> do you feel like that's a good install job? <laughs> this isn't too bad, but I have a problem up here. <laughs> okay. And what's the problem up there? We have the rim joist, you know, just like in that other case, we have a rim joist that we have, and it's actually kind of rolled over. Yeah. And there's no air barrier. Yeah. And so if we pulled those out, I, I can almost guarantee you we're going to have wet wood, the rim board behind that insulation. It's going to be wet. Yeah. Because if it's condensing here, it's, it's going to be condensing, condensing there. there. Yeah. Because that fiberglass insulation isn't going to stop this moisture. This moisture is coming from inside. Maybe it's ground moisture coming up through. Maybe they create a lot of moisture. People with lots of plants in their house create more moisture. Yeah. You need to address the moisture. Yep. So, you know, as far as the bats in the walls, they don't look too bad. They have a vapor barrier over them, which you really don't need in a basement, but um, they, they don't look as bad as some of them. Um, entire industries um, are in existence now because they specialize in combating building moisture issues. Okay, I just have a couple of slides, and these are from a case in Utah. And these are from a friend of mine, Dean Webb, who is a forensic building expert. He is an expert witness that I've worked with on several projects, and that's all he does is work on litigation, where uh, construction defects, and he's a busy man. I bet. <laughs> and we look at this, and I don't see anything you know, looking at that, that looks bad. It looks like a nice little um, cultured stone, you know, installation. It looks like it's fairly clean and, and done well. But obviously, as Dean mentioned, they had some moisture problems inside. And so he was there to take some pictures as they began repairs. And uh, it's a townhouse project with multiple units. So there's not just one of their, these, there was like 30 or 40 of them. And uh, the chimneys all appear okay from the outside. They passed inspection. The inspector probably didn't see the defect in the, in the installation because as we start looking at the next picture, we won't see it either until we go just a little bit further. But let's, here's one stone has been pulled off. So if we go back, one of these corner stones okay. someplace has been pulled off. And it's a little bright, but we can see the metal lath mm -hmm. that's kind of got pulled off as they pulled the, the thin set that held the stone on. But you can see that the wire was there as supposed to. And then this is building paper. And that's required to have a, two layers of building paper underneath there. So that all looked compliant. So the inspector might have come by before they put stone on it and s observed the building paper on there and passed the inspection. Mm -hmm. You know, the metal lath was on it. Everything was good. Um, we had the building paper under the metal lath. It appears dry and code compliant. But if you cut the building paper off or tear the building paper off, and mentioned there's two layers of it, which the code requires, we see something behind there that looks like kind of a rubberized material. And it's a material that I recognize, and he did, and that's what we call grace ice and water shield. So it is a rubberized membrane that's sticky on the backside 
and we use it in roof valleys. Okay. And we use it at the edge of the roof where you'll get an ice dam. And it's a wonderful product. It's an absolutely fantastic product because it will stop leaks. I mean, you can put nails through it, and if you get an ice dam and water building up, it it's flexible enough that it seals against the nails. Oh, wow. So it's, it's really a great product. So why would they put it on a chimney? <laughs> because someone somewhere along the line had some leaks. Okay. And so he thought, well, I'm going to put this on this chimney. And so they wrapped them all with that. And what we're creating is a vapor barrier where it's like putting plastic on the outside. So what happens with the moisture inside, mm-hmm. even if it's just a little bit of moisture, as it tries to migrate through the wall with the heat flow through the wall, it, it encounters trapped. that yeah. and it stops. Yeah. I mean, that is sealed as tight as this this water bottle. water bottle. And so the water can't get anywhere. Well, what's the temperature of that when it's cold in the winter? It's outside temperature. Yeah. It's the only thing that's between it and outside is stone, and stone's not an insulator. So... Um, so how did they find out that this was an issue? Like, moisture inside. Okay. In the chimney? No, inside this okay. inside the space. Okay. I think they were smelling the mold or smelling oh, the mildew. Okay, okay. And they did and maybe there was even water running down and out of the this fireplace, is fireplace yeah. out in front of the fireplace. Yeah. So now Dean has pulled that grace off and you know, he's had to cut it to pull it off and what do we see? We see a white mildewy so that is moisture that's made it in through drywall around the fireplace through the OSB and then it stopped and it's just been saturated so the OSB is going to be bad everything's bad so we strip off the chimneys oh that's expensive all new new stone (laughs) all, all new everything and do it right that's that's a big expense yeah by not understanding building science mm-hmm now, not everybody knows it, and I've learned, I learn stuff all the time. Everybody needs to learn stuff, but that's why I think it's important that we do these types of podcasts, and there's other resources that are available. We need to, we need to be thinking about building sciences as we, um, as we build buildings, if, we, if we're building them or we're inspecting them or whatever our involvement is in our buildings, in our in our drive to conserve energy, we need to make sure we understand the science so that um, we don't have these kinds of issues. This is absolutely the incorrect method of air sealing. We need an air barrier on the outside and the building paper is kind of, this stuff is not the best air barrier. You know, a Tyvek, that white stuff is a little bit better air barrier, but the grace is not an air barrier. It's a Mm -hmm. water barrier. It's Mm -hmm. a waterproof membrane. Um, It's the misapplication of a very good product. And uh, so surely you can't blame it on the Grace Grace product. Um, So multiple chimneys required full removal of stone, OSB, and then materials installed correctly. Kind of makes you sick, doesn't it, when you look at that and you think of how much that cost uh, to come in and yeah. and take care of all that. Dean showed me other pictures of that, and there were just stacks and stacks of the new stone lined up, ready to be installed when they tore everything apart and redid it the second time. Ugh. Breaks my heart. Yeah. If only someone would have done the extra work to do it right the first do time. Do it right and understand the science of it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Katie. Yeah, it was thanks, great Brent. To- Great to have this discussion. Uh, Those that are watching, we encourage you to send comments, questions. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening to our three-part series today on um, building science, uh, getting up to code, energy talks with Brent Ersenbach. Please feel free to follow our YouTube channel and us on Spotify. Send us any questions you may have or any requests for upcoming future episodes. Thank you. Thanks.